Waters Library is very happy to welcome you to our first official Open Education Week event. Uh, Open Education Week was established to bring awareness to the cost of course materials and the possibilities of open education and open educational resources. Our speaker, Cheryl Casey, is the Open Education Librarian at the University of Arizona. She has a wealth of experience with Open Educational Resources, or OER. Uh, she has led OER initiatives at the University of Arizona since 2014. She is a trainer for the Open Education Network and, it's, and is beginning her fifth year as an instructor for Open Education Network Certificate in OER Librarianship. She was my instructor when I went through the certificate program and I learned so much from that experience. So everyone, please welcome Cheryl for her session, Boosting Student Success with OER. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sarah. Really appreciate the invitation. And it was great to have you as part of the cohort. All right. So yeah, happy Open Education Week, everybody. Uh, and as Sarah said, this is being celebrated globally. Uh, and the goal of this session today is just to introduce you to OER and open pedagogy, which I define as involving students in the creation of OER. Uh, we'll talk about Creative Commons licenses um, and how to incorporate OER into instruction and um, where to find OER. So I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, and respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on uh, the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, there are 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Tohono O'odham and the Yaqui. And since sharing is a core value of open education, these slides um, will be available. I've sent them to Sarah to distribute, and you're free to reuse and customize them. We'll only have time today to scratch the surface of open education, um, but I want you to leave with a wealth of resources. And so I've created this OER toolkit. Um, it features the sites and resources I'm about to show you and, and many, many more. During Open Education Week a few years ago at the University of Arizona, I asked our students to complete this prompt. If I didn't have to buy textbooks, I could dot, dot, dot. And we got some heartbreaking responses. Actually pay rent on time, live again and get sleep, survive, buy groceries. And I liked how the student added the hashtag, the struggle. Not work until 3 a.m. before school, eat food. Another added, um, not have debt-induced panic attacks. Students can't learn from books they can't afford. And as a librarian, I can't do much about uh, tuition and fees and room and board or parking expenses, but I can do something about course materials. And so can all of us. You can see from this chart how the price of college textbooks has risen faster than many uh, other categories of consumer goods. I was in a webinar recently where a student said they changed their major because of the cost of course materials. Um, another student told me um, that when they were taking a Spanish 101 class, they calculated that the courseware cost $100, but it was worth 10% of their grade. So they decided uh, not to buy the courseware to settle for at best a B in the class. And that just breaks my heart to hear those stories because not only are those students missing out on all of that learning, but the lower grades can endanger academic scholarships, uh, retention in graduation, and grad school opportunities. Um, you can see from this chart that the, the little squiggle for college textbooks leveled off after years of sharp increases, but now it's starting to creep back up again, which is concerning. And these sobering percentages from a big uh, survey in Florida, but replicated across the US, show the negative impacts of high textbook costs. We clearly don't want to see 
lower grades or graduation delays due to dropped and failed courses. A large study at the University of Georgia found that success increased for all students when they had free day one access to OER. But Pell recipients, part-time students, and underrepresented groups especially benefited. So let's explore how to find OER and incorporate these resources into instruction. I think it's important to start with a shared definition of OER. This one comes from uh, your state's education code. Um, so teaching, learning, or research resources that are in the public domain or released under an intellectual property license, often a Creative Commons license, which we'll get to, that permits the free use, adaptation, and redistribution of the resource by any person. Um, it goes on to uh, describe tools, materials, techniques, whether digital or otherwise, used to support access to knowledge. So OER can encompass a wide range of material types, from videos to test questions to textbooks to full courses. And I run into a lot of confusion between free-to-use resources and OER. People can find a ton of free content out there online, including illegally pirated content. But the permissions and the customizability make OER unique. So in order to be considered OER, a resource needs to be not only free, but give the user the freedom to do what we call the five R's. And the first one is retain, which means they can download, they can duplicate. Reuse means they can use it more than once in a variety of ways. Revise means they can modify, they can translate. Remix they, means they can combine it either with their own content or uh, other OER, mash it up into new and different ways. And redistribute means that they can share copies. There are so many benefits to OER and I, pulled copies of your mission and vision statements um, just to look at some of the ways that OER align with uh, A&M Commerce's mission and vision. So by being free to use, OER make a college education more accessible and affordable. OER level the playing field and enable all students to achieve. No student's academic progress is thwarted because they can't afford to buy the required materials. The customizability of OER uh, mean they can serve an inclusive community. They can be personalized for diverse learners, and they can include voices, viewpoints, and examples that are often missing from commercial textbooks. Students find customized OER more relevant and impactful. OER and open pedagogy foster collaboration and sharing. OER authored by your faculty and students would be shared with the world, advancing knowledge and widening their impact. And a move toward zero or course materials with zero costs could give AM Commerce a competitive advantage over other colleges and universities, too. What's the return on investment for OER and textbook affordability initiatives? Potentially huge. Um, and that's why states, universities, the federal government, donors, and philanthropic groups have invested millions of dollars in OER. At the U of A, we recently received a $750,000 gift from a Danish corporation to fund OER in culinary medicine. Um, for faculty, I think it's really important to emphasize how OER expand their academic freedom. They're not limited just to what's available from commercial options. And with the customizability, they can rearrange the order of the chapters, cut out ones that they don't need, increase relevancy with local examples and up-to-date, you know, content, the latest news. Um, and reflect your own student body by changing images, names, problem sets, and, and other examples so that students can see themselves in the course materials. 
the number one question I get is where to find OER. And there's no central repository for finding OER. <laughs> so think of it as a bit of a treasure hunt. Um, all of these resources are listed in the toolkit. And in the next slides, I'll walk through some of my favorite sources. For college textbooks, the Open Textbook Library is the first place I personally go. It's run by the Open Education Network, and it now has nearly 1,200 open textbooks. You can do the five R's with all of these textbooks. Most have faculty authored reviews, and it also lists textbooks that are in development and coming soon. The Pressbooks directory is another favorite OER search tool. Uh, it currently features more than 5,000 books published across 144 Pressbooks networks. Um, this is a great place for us to find content that we can clone and customize with our Pressbooks publishing platform. The directory also features curated collections on things like language learning, high enrollment, and um, I got a message that flashed, sorry. <laughs> that maybe I lost my sound there for a second. Uh, and, and then it, the Pressbooks directory also has filters for things like language and H5P interactive learning activities, which are often built into the Pressbooks. OpenStax is my favorite OER publisher. It's a project out of Rice University, and for classes in science, math, business, statistics, economics, humanities, social sciences, and college success, it's a fabulous option. The 2E and 3E on these covers mean that these are second and third editions. And in 2020, OpenStax announced $12.5 million in new funding that will allow it to more than double the size of uh, its library to 90 titles. Uh, it's currently working with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board to release eight new nursing textbooks uh, starting in spring 2024. Our faculty are excited about the best-selling organic chemistry textbook, which the author has moved from Cengage to OpenStax. That's coming this fall. And other new books are planned for engineering, technology, liberal arts, and um, other courses at the college and high school levels. OpenStax books come in a variety of formats that give users a lot of choice. So they're all free to read online and download. Many titles have free Kindle versions. Most have free book share versions for people um, with low vision or who are blind. And if a student wants a print copy, we can work with our campus bookstore to sell low cost print copies. Um, and they even buy them back and, and sell them used for lower costs each year. Each OpenStax title comes with free resources for faculty, such as PowerPoint slides and solutions to end of chapter problems. The OER, Cob, or OER Commons Hub is a place where instructors can share resources they've created to go with the books. Um, this pr Principles of Management book also has course cartridges for multiple learning management systems and an annotated video guide. OpenStax has added guided lecture notes, diversity and representation development guidelines, editable Google Docs and Google Forms, and testable images where they um, share the images without the uh, labels so that it can be used in quizzes or tests. To access the PowerPoint slides in the solutions manual, faculty just need to create a free instructor account um, OpenStax verifies their instructor's status, and that's just to thwart students from getting their hands on these solutions. If faculty want uh, courseware for student practice or homework or tests or quizzes, OpenStax partners with 93 different technology companies to make low-cost add-ons an option. These are just a few of the options. Uh, Top Hat, which you might be familiar with, is another one. Um, 
so yeah and and these are all typically less than forty dollars which is far less than the hundred dollars that um that we often see for courseware and these other platforms LibreTex is another great resource. It's an OER project based out of the University of California, Davis. And in 2018, they received a $5 million grant from the US Department of Education. So they now have uh, textbooks, um, free interactive tools, Spanish language materials, an OER remixer, and uh, an open assessment and homework platform called ADAPT. Um, I recently read they got five million dollars more in new funding um, to advance that that platform. Um, they're working with My Open Math um, and some other projects, um, so they have a lot of very cool options. For language learning, I recommend Corel, um, the Center for OER and Language Learning at the University of Texas at Austin, it offers materials in the languages listed in the lower left corner. For workforce development, Skills Commons features training materials for a range of careers. Um, the US Department of Labor invested $1.9 billion in this OER project. Um, it's managed by CSU Long Beach and Merlot, and more than 700 institutions contributed content. So it covers construction, manufacturing, healthcare, IT, and other topics. For OER by discipline, BC Campus publishes this helpful directory, which they're great about regularly updating. Um, when I work with particular subjects, um, especially ones that I'm unfamiliar with, um, this is a go-to resource. There are several OER mega search tools available. Oasis is, is my favorite because of its user friendliness. Um, it's a project of uh, SUNY Geneseo, and it can help find OER from 115 different sources. Uh, you can browse by subject and by specific content types. So here you see textbooks, courses, course materials, interactive simulations. They also have podcasts, audiobooks, primary sources, and other content types. We have this OASIS search box embedded on our library's Find OER page, and a link to the widget code is included in the OER toolkit. You can also use Google Advanced Search to find OER. Um, the usage rights filter, um, if you use the drop down menu to select free to use, share, or modify, even commercially, that leads you to the, the most flexible licenses, um, openly licensed or in the public domain. And for images, I recommend Openverse. Um, this is Creative Commons' new search tool, which they've rebranded. Uh, you can filter by a specific Creative Commons license or by public domain content. So more than 600 million works. And they recently included audio as well. So for our students doing a, um, an exercise where they needed to incorporate openly licensed music, this would be a good source. I just want to stop here and ask if you have a favorite OER site. Do you have experience using any of these OER resources? And I encourage you to um, type your answer in the chat. Press folks in OER Commons. Yes, I did not include OER Commons, but that is an excellent one, especially with the hubs that they now have available uh, for individual institutions and uh, consortia. Open Textbook Library. Yep. Fabulous project. Oh, good. Okay. Check out Openverse and Corel. Yes. I did not include OER Commons because I found 
that it sometimes causes confusion among our faculty. Excuse me. <laughs> um, it and Merlot can include content that's free but not openly licensed. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, so I just encourage people to check the licenses carefully when they find content in Merlot and OER Commons. So how does Bill use the open textbook library? Bill, can you tell us? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I just went to the site and I looked for philosophy books. So I've used uh, one of their logic or some of the some of one of their logic textbooks and an intro to philosophy textbook. Great. Yeah, the OpenStax content is in there. I know uh, OpenStax has a new philosophy textbook. And whenever there's an OpenStax title available, I recommend that faculty start there just because of all of the free instructor resources that, that go along with it. Can students have access to those textbooks? Yes, uh, all of these textbooks are completely free to use, download, share, keep, um, and customize. And we can also help you integrate it into your course, uh, Dr. Miller. Thanks. Great. So once people find OER, the next question I usually get is, OK, now what can I do with it? And understanding Creative Commons licenses is the key to answering that question. So Creative Commons licenses debuted in 2002. And there are a set of free public licenses that have been broadly adopted all over the world. While creative com or while copyright is all rights reserved, Creative Commons is some rights reserved. Uh, creative Commons licenses work with copyright to enable creators to share as many or as few rights as they choose. And there are more than two billion digital works available with these Creative Commons licenses, and the number is growing all the time. If you can decipher Creative Commons licenses, you'll know exactly what creators have given you the right to do. So there are four building blocks to the licenses. The first one is um, attribution or BY with the person symbol. This lets you distribute, remix, tweak, build upon someone else's work, even commercially, as long as you credit them. Uh, the next one, NC, the dollar sign with the slash through it, stands for non-commercial. It means you can't use someone else's work for commercial advantage or monetary compensation. Um, this causes some confusion in educational settings where you know, we're charging students tuition to attend the class. Uh, it's perfectly fine to use uh, non-commercial textbooks in, in those instances. Um, even sell them as long as it's cost and not a, a substantial market um, markup. SA stands for share alike. If you make changes to the content, you need to reshare it uh, under identical terms. And then ND stands for no derivatives. And it means you can share all or part of the content, but if you make any changes to it, you can't reshare it. So those four elements can be combined into these six different licenses. Notice that they all have BY, and they all require attribution. So CCBY is the least restrictive license. CCBY NC ND is the most restrictive. Anything with the ND element, the no derivatives element, uh, is not considered OER, because remember the revise and redistribute are two of the five R's. Um, ND content is still free to use though. TED Talks, for example, use the CC BY NC ND license. 
even more flexible than Creative Commons licensed content is content that's in the public domain. Um, these works are free of copyright and have no restrictions on use, although it's always good practice to attribute. Generally, if a work was first published in the US in 1927 or earlier, it's in the public domain. And on January 1st of this year, a bunch of new works entered the public domain, including Irvin Berlin's words and music to Putting on the Ritz and The Jazz Singer, which was the first feature length film with synchronized dialogue and sound. So Creative Commons offers two tools for marking works that are in the public domain. The first one is uh, the copyright symbol with a slash through it, the public domain mark. It allows you to mark other people's works that are in the public domain. Uh, the second one, the zero with the uh, slash through it is um, the CC0 tool. And that allows creators to waive all their rights and put their own work in the public domain. In 2020, the Smithsonian Institution announced that it had released 2.8 million images and data into the public domain using CC0. We're also seeing this increasingly required for data sets in federal grants. And remember the Openverse, the um, search tool for images. I love how it generates the image attribution for you with the title of the work, the source, the author, and the CC license. Um, this tassel format where the T is for title, A is for author, S is for source, L is for license, is recommended by Creative Commons for attribution. Um, and remember that attribution is required for all Creative Commons licensed works. There are entire courses on Creative Commons and, uh, and copyright if you want to learn more. Um, one, resource is to be, one resource to be aware of is this Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for OER. It provides guidance on evaluating when and how third-party copyrighted materials can be used in OER. If you want to use a piece of content in OER that's not openly licensed and not in the public domain, the fair use exception to US copyright law may be an option. Um, you can also link to it, uh, or you can ask the copyright holder for permission to use it. Accessibility is an important consideration for OER and all instructional materials. And the U of A's Disability Resource Center tells me that EPUB versions of eBooks are more accessible than PDFs. Um, BC Campus offers an accessibility toolkit, and its open textbook collection is home to hundreds of textbooks. Of those, 150 are categorized as accessible and meet the accessibility criteria, criteria uh, that BC Campus has developed. I sometimes get questions about quality. And, you know, if it's so great, why are people giving OER away? Um, publishers like OpenStax and Milne Open Textbooks use a formal peer review system, just like commercial publishers do. Sites like the Open Textbook Library, OER Commons, and Merlot offer user reviews. Uh, this public speaking textbook, for example, has 56 reviews, so faculty can see what colleagues think of the content, and reviews in the Open Textbook Library cover a really in-depth 10-category rubric. If you're a faculty member or instructional designer who's searched for OER in the past and, and not been successful, I encourage you to reach out to your library for help. Um, keep checking these OER sites because new content is released all the time. Um, the Open Textbook Library and Rebus community offer lists of textbooks in development. And when I work with faculty, I let them know that OER aren't our only tool in our affordability toolkit. Um, they're the tool I start with because of the customizability, free, access and perpetual access. 
Um, but next we look at library license materials, uh, ebooks, streaming video, articles and chapters. We don't have course material or course reserves, but I know you do. Um, my role is to provide options for faculty. They're the subject matter experts and also the experts on the scope, sequence, and um, learning objectives for their courses. So um, they're the decision makers. And if free to use options aren't available or aren't a good fit, I refer them to their, our bookstore, which um, is campus owned and has been a fabulous partner in our affordability initiatives. It's really the day one access to all of these that's so critical for student success. To help instructors explore free to use course materials, um, I launched this check for ebook availability form on our library website. We try to buy unlimited user ebooks for every required textbook. Um, but due to publisher restrictions, we can only get about 20% of them. Publishers find it more profitable to sell directly to students, so they often won't allow academic libraries to buy ebook licenses. But we provide as many as we can and estimate we've saved students about $10 million since uh, 2012. We encourage faculty to fit, submit this form before they uh, submit their textbook adoption to the bookstores. And uh, this allows us to help them find other alternatives if an unlimited user ebook isn't available. The one-on-one the -on -one help um, can be time intensive, but I think it's really paid off for our students. Another way to expand course material options is through open pedagogy, uh, involving students in the creation of OER. So rather than doing disposable assignments, students can engage in deeper and more active learning and contribute to the world's knowledge commons. So they can annotate readings or create textbooks, videos, test banks, lab assignments, podcasts. They can translate content. They can update Wikipedia entries, making the information more factually accurate, adding citations, expanding the diversity of entries. And there are some great resources out there for open pedagogy, including this uh, open pedagogy project roadmap, uh, which features case studies and examples. At the U of A, we launched the Pressbooks publishing platform in 2020 to facilitate the creation of OER. Um, it can also produce all rights reserved content. Um, our platform currently has 230 book projects and more than 1,200 users, and it's free for any employee or student to set up an account. There are a number of guides to help with creating or adapting OER. Um, the Open Education Network offers a publishing curriculum that's free for anybody to access. All of these resources are linked in the OER toolkit under Open Pedagogy, OER Publishing, and OER Customization. Um, Humans or Social Media was the first big textbook project to be published on our pl Pressbooks platform and is a great example of open pedagogy. Um, the instructor uh, is in our iSchool and uh, she participated in our OER learning community and totally revamped her gen ed class when she learned about OER. And uh, so she created assignments for her students to write essays, create graphics, um, glossary entries, audio clips, video clips. And uh, it was just a really fabulous project. Uh, on the right uh, is something that our gen ed program produced. Um, it's not OER, but it reaches um, close to 9,000 students um, each year features essays from faculty and staff across campus. And in 2022, it was viewed 400,000 times and had 114,000 visitors. So the impact has been great. For my sabbatical research in 2021, I surveyed students about their experience working on humans or social media. And they wrote a lot about why they thought the learning outcomes were better. 
Um, you can see here, it made us feel like our opinions and our voices were heard and appreciated for the first time. I like how it put student voices out in the world. The opportunity to be published gave me more incentive to make sure my assignments were my best product. Feel like I learned more, had more motivation. And I love that, you know, when students said more classes should be like this. So pilot is one of my favorite words. If switching to OER completely seems like too big of a lift for faculty, I encourage them to try out just one piece of OER content, even as a supplemental resource. Uh, they can try it out, see how students like it, and um, gradually make the switch to free to use resources. It's fine to start small, pilot and experiment. So we've we've covered a lot of ground in a short time, but um, I hope you'll come away with at least one idea today. My takeaway message is that you can do this. You can make education more affordable, more accessible, more inclusive, and the return on investment um, and impact on student success is huge. Um, I'd like you to take just a few seconds to think about something you can follow up on from this session. Um, I know I come away from events like this really energized and then I get lost in my email and my to do list. Um, so, you know, if you can add something to your calendar to or your to do list to follow up on, or if you feel comfortable putting in the chat, you know, one one idea that you can pursue to make a little bit of progress in this area. Oh, great. Thanks for posting the link um, to the library's OER research guide. Fabulous. Look at the open textbook library. Yes. Become more familiar with uh, multiple platforms for searching for OER. Thanks for sharing. And I promise to leave time for questions, so I will open it up now. And I see you noted that, yeah, several states have produced um, OER collections. So yeah, there's a lot of great work happening all across the country, but I really admire what's happening in places like Texas and Oregon, Colorado, New York. Uh, I feel like we're behind here in Arizona. <laughs> we're, we're trying to do as much as we can. Are there any other questions for Cheryl? Well, Cheryl, I just really want to thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your expertise. It was extremely rewarding. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for the invitation. And thank you everyone for coming and spending time with us this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed it.